When we started off, we had a manager in Liverpool called Alan Williams. He was a great guy, a really good motivator, and very good for us at the time. So Paul McCartney said that about this fellow, the man who gave the Beatles away, of course, their first manager, Mr. Alan Williams. And 20 years ago, my brother Alan and I took him into our recording studio and recorded his memoirs for a CD, which until now has never been heard by the world. It's been heard by a couple of people who may have bought one at the convention where Alan used to sell them, along with some of his mugs and photographs and all that sort of stuff. So sit back and enjoy this world exclusive. It's, it is fascinating. 54 minutes of the man who gave the Beatles away. Enjoy. In 1958, Alan Williams, a plumber by trade, opened a coffee bar club in Seal Street, Liverpool, called the Jacaranda. The Jack, as it was known, would have been no different from any other coffee bar had it not been for four regular customers, who fancied themselves as the next big thing. It was in this unlikely setting that one of the greatest rock and roll stories began. My name is Alan Williams. I was born in 1930. I suppose... Show business began with me at the tender age of 10. My father used to run war dances, because at the time we were having a, a war with Germany. And I can remember as a 10-year-old uh, how exciting it was. We didn't know the dangers of what was happening all around us. Uh, all we saw was tracer bullets flying in the air, incendiary bombs dropping, and my father used to run uh, local hop dancers. They were called war dancers. It was uh, 1944 when I became the cloakroom boy at my father's dancers. It then progressed that I would start the ballroom dancing off, which I hated. <laughs> you could imagine everybody sitting around looking at each other, waiting for somebody to start it off. And that was me. On one occasion, my dad was busy taking the money on the door and he said to me, uh, go and announce the next dance. And that was my introduction of being an MC. We had strict ballroom rules. The MC had to strut up and down the middle of the dance floor to make sure the dancers went anti-clockwise. And then Jive came into it. And my father hated this. This was a breakaway from ballroom dancing and we had to say no jiving please but then it was progressing jive halls were coming in my dad had to move with the times so what we did we had jivers at the top end of the floor only and was known as jivers corner and i liked the idea of the jiving because i was getting fed up with the ballroom dancing so i became a promoter in my own right i'm now approaching the age of 18 and my real ambition was to be a singer. There was an advert in the Echo wanting tenors for the Bentley Operatic Society. So I auditioned and got the job. It was the Amateur Operatics doing Gilbert and Sullivan. We were doing one show, I think it was HMS Pinafore, when we got told we couldn't do it because Doily Cart were appearing three weeks before us or two months. And we had to change, and we changed to Merry England, which required a dancer. And the dancer that came along became my future wife, which was Beryl Chang. She was in the Waterloo Amateur Operatic Society. But we had a problem that her family were against the marriage. Anyway, I survived, and we married, and we lived happily ever after, until I opened the Blue Angel, and then, you know... I started to flirt a bit. I remember in my courting days, oh, I must have been about 24. Beryl being a school teacher, she would have holidays around about six weeks. And we went hitchhiking. And we finished up in Holland, hitchhiking through Holland and France. And we used to go to 
jazz clubs in Groningen. They would have uh, a jazz festival. That was on the borders of Holland and Germany. And then we went to uh, Paris. I always remember it on the Saint Michel area, which is the student quarter. And there was jazz clubs there in the basements where all these kids were going and having a ball. And so I got the idea of uh, opening a coffee bar club. It was around about 1957, 58, and I found these premises in Slater Street, 23 Slater Street, which was uh, a watch repairers which had gone out of business. And I checked out with the law that nobody could stop you opening a coffee bar club for social intercourse, as long as you didn't sell alcohol. Nobody thought of this idea. So we proceeded with my experience as a plumber and all my mates in the building trade. It cost me about £350. I did the plumbing, friends of mine did the plastering, uh, the dance floor was ready mixed concrete poured through the coal cellar and we opened the jacaranda. And then the decoration was done by art students. You know, we couldn't afford, uh, you know, interior decorators. It was very, very basic. And you employed art students to just splash and paint around the walls, which gave it atmosphere. And we had these art students used to hang around the jacaranda. They used to, you know, miss lectures. And amongst them uh, who became friends was Stuart Sutcliffe and uh, John Lennon and knowing that uh, Stuart and John were from the art school I asked them would they redecorate the ladies toilets which they agreed for a fee of £10. I used to share the ladies toilet with the sweet shop next door we had a communal entry and these ladies were upset by the obscene graffiti so the first money I ever paid the Beatles was £10 to uh, paint the ladies' toilet, and they made such an awful mess of it. I preferred the graffiti. <laughs> so that was my first introduction to uh, Stuart and John. Uh, no signs that they were in a group. So we'd uh, completed the work, uh, but what music were we going to play there? I went to this afternoon uh, drinking club, I think it was Nicky's the Greek, in Princess Avenue. And they had a steel band playing there in the afternoons. And I thought, wow, that would be great, you know, to play in the jacaranda. And so I hunted them down and I traced uh, a character called Lord Woodbine, who became quite famous in the 60s. He became my mate. And he said, yes, they will play in the jacaranda. And so uh, the steel band were a huge success. And I was getting the entrepreneurial thing uh, going with me. I went to see my first rock and roll show at the Empire, which was a production of uh, Larry Pons, who was the impresario of the, of the day. And he was doing a tour with Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent. And he had a stable of uh, rock and roll stars. He was the god. And I was impressed with this. And I thought, wow, I'd love to buy that show. And so I did. I phoned up Larry Pons uh, two months after the concert. And he said, yes, uh, the for sale. We had a boxing stadium in Liverpool downtown. And that was, to me, a perfect venue because the boxing ring was the uh, the fulcrum that was the stage and no matter where the audience was the uh, that was the center point but tragically two weeks before the show eddie cochran got killed in a car crash in england and gene vincent was in the same crash but gene vincent uh, survived he was virtually uninjured and so uh, pounds phoned me up and he said well uh, i presume you're cancelling I said, well, you know, I've sold quite a few tickets, uh, you know, me, me, me being so sympathetic to uh, <laughs> the fact that Eddie Cochran had been killed. And I said, well, what about Gene Vincent? Oh, he said, yeah, he's okay, he's willing to do it. So then I thought, 
Uh, what if I pad out the first half of the show with Liverpool groups? Uh, they all used to hang out the jacaranda. I used to let them rehearse in the basement for free. And I thought, well, these are great. These, these groups are good. Rory Storm, uh, Jerry Marsden, uh, a group called uh, The Big Three. And I thought, well, if I put them on the first half, I've got a show. Unknown to me, in the audience that night was The Beatles. Stuart Sutcliffe, John Lennon, Paul McCartney and George Harrison. And afterwards, when we went back to the Jacaranda and Larry Pons was holding uh, court, wanting to book my groups to go to Scotland, they were listening to this. And the next day that I went in, they said to me, when are you going to do something for us like Alan? I said, well, there's no more painting to be done. And he said, no, we, we've got a group. I said, well, I didn't know that. You never mentioned it. Oh, he said, we play the art school every Saturday night. And by that time, we'd sort of become friends. I liked their personalities. And will you manage us? I said, yeah, sure. I never auditioned them or anything. Because a lot of people said they were the crap group. You know, they were bums and all that sort of thing. So the first thing we did was find them a drummer. And uh, there was this guy called Cass from the Casanovas. And I said, uh, Cass, can you help us out here? I said, you know, this uh, group I'm going to manage, uh, they haven't got a drummer. And Cass said to John, he said, well, what do you call yourselves? He said, well, we call ourselves the Beatles. He said, you can't have a name like that. Remember in those days it was Cliff Richards and the Shadows. It was Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. And uh, John said, well, we like the name. Oh, he said, no, you can't have that name. And they were impressed by him because uh, he later became uh, the big three. And he said, no, let's think about it. Your name is John. How about Long John and the Silver Beatles? Long John Silver, do you get the play on words? And they could see them all wince, but they went and agreed with it to get the drummer. They only went out about three or four times at the most as the Silver Beatles. And the drummer he got was a guy called Tommy Moore, who was ten years older than any of them. So there was a generation gap. He was a very good drummer, but John used to crucify him with his, uh, his sarcastic wit. So, Long John and the Silver Beatles it was. But where were they going to play? The Beatles were that naive in those days that they thought they didn't need a drummer that the bass player would substitute. And the bass player who couldn't play was Stuart Sutcliffe, who was John Lennon's best mate at that time at the art school. He had a a flat that they used to share in the basement in uh, Percy Street. We're going now January, February 1960. So then it was up to me to get them work. And I was getting them uh, good money. You know, I was getting them sort of like £12 in those days, which was good money. I mean, the Cavanaugh used to pay £8 uh, for a group in those days. We were plodding along quite nicely. And then Larry Pons, which I mentioned earlier, wanted me to set up an audition uh, for Liverpool groups to be a backing group for Billy Fury. And I thought, well, I'm going to throw the Beatles in at the deep end here uh, with uh, Stuart Sutcliffe, even though, you know, he wasn't a very good musician, bass player. And we had the auditions. Oh, God, there were so many Liverpool groups there. And would you believe it, uh, Billy Fury actually wanted the Beatles to be his backing group. Which, you know, I thought, wow, that's great. And then they'd spotted Stuart Sutcliffe, the bass player, couldn't play hardly. And he was so embarrassed, Stuart, that he played with his back, as it were, to the audience. And Pond said, uh, yes, we'll have the group called the, the Beatles, but... Uh, we can't afford a five-piece. He was being kind. Uh, you'll have to get rid of the bass player. And to my amazement, John said, uh, no, if you don't take us, you know, all five of us, 
uh, were not interested. So uh, they turned the offer down. But we did salvage something out of it that uh, he wanted the Beatles to back uh, a group called Duffy Power and Johnny Gentle on a tour of Scotland. <laughs> there was one uh, gig that they were playing uh, in Scotland and for some reason Johnny Gentle decided to drive uh, the van to the gig and they went down a one-way street and they crashed into a car and all the lads were in the back of the van with all the instruments and guitar cases and this guitar case slid with the impact and hit poor Tommy Moore, the drummer, right in the mouth and knocked all his front teeth out so he was taken to hospital which John Lennon thought was hilarious and went on to play the gig. Paul fancied his chances at playing drums but Duncan McKenna wouldn't have any of it so they had to go back to the hospital and persuade Tommy uh, to play the gig that night so John Lennon was in aesthetic seeing this poor lad in agony playing with his mouth all strapped up and bandaged. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the tour, Tommy came home on his own and cursing and saying that he'd never, ever play with the Beatles again. But uh, the problem was that Tommy had a live-in girlfriend and because Tommy arrived back in Liverpool penniless, she said, it's either the Beatles or me. So Tommy decided there wasn't much future in the Beatles. So it was exit stage left for poor Tommy Moore. Poor lad. Could you imagine at the height of the Beatles fame, he's driving that awful forklift truck around Garston Bottleworks, folks. I wonder what his girlfriend... I would have knocked shite out of her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Meantime, back at the Jacaranda, I go down, I always remember it was on a Monday night, and there was no steel band. Apparently I was the last to know, they'd done a runner to Hamburg. So then I had no alternative but to run round in my uh, Jaguar, which I had in those days when the lamppost didn't hit me, and uh, rounded up the Beatles, put them in the basement, with the little tiny amplifiers and whatever. And I always remember George coming up to me, because he was the, you know, the baby of the group, as it were, and saying, uh, Alan, can we borrow the brush and have you got a mop? I said, yeah, but it's clean down there. Oh, he said, no, never mind, we just want a broom handle and uh, a mop handle. And out of curiosity, I went down later on, and lo and behold... One of the girls who was holding the broom with the mic tied to the end of it was Cynthia Lennon. And another girlfriend had the mop with the uh, mic tied to it. And that's how poor they were. So the Beatles became a regular feature at the Jacaranda with the mics tied on the end of brooms and mops. Then I got a letter from uh, Hamburg from the steel band saying, why don't I go over to Hamburg? That was a swinging scene, and I could open a club there, or even take some of my groups across, like Jerry and the Pacemakers. No mention, of course, uh, the Beatles. So this is the story of Hamburg and how it all began from Liverpool. Keep practising was the phrase the Beatles became tired of hearing in between the occasional gigs they were playing at this time. But change was just around the corner. Lord Woodbine and I, Woody, uh, we had a strip club uh, called the, um, the New Cabaret Artists Club. <laughs> Where would you believe it? Uh, the Beatles actually backed one of the strippers because she wouldn't strip to uh, the jukebox. And we weren't happy with running a strip club. It wasn't our scene. So we sold it and we decided to go to Hamburg with the profit. Now, in Hamburg, uh, which was really a swinging town, and it was our first time there, we stayed at a hotel, the Hotel Stein, 
And I had this uh, tape recording of all the groups. In those days, it was reel to reel, not a cassette. And we were walking around the uh, the Reaper Barn, and then we went into a side street called the Gross of Freiheit. And there I heard music coming from the basement of a club called the Kaiser Keller. And it was obviously rock and roll music. And I said, wow, I'm going in there. This is the place. So I went down the basement and there was this awful German band playing Tutti Frutti. And all the kids couldn't even get up and dance to them. And next minute it was announced, their pause, which means interval. And they put on the jukebox and everybody got up. So I thought, this is it. So I asked for one of the waiters, could I see the manager that I was from uh, Liverpool, England. And I had uh, ideas for him to bring uh, English bands over. So I was taken into the office and introduced to the owner, who was Herr Koschmider, Bruno Koschmider. And uh, I said, I have this tape of Liverpool bands. I think it would be very good business for you to have here. And we discussed how much it was. I said that they would come over for £100. They will pay the way here and you pay for them to go back to Liverpool. And that was agreed. So he said, yeah, let me hear the music. So he brings out this beautiful Grundig machine. I put the tape on. He pressed the play button. And next minute, all I heard was... Somebody had taped right through the middle and wiped everything out. And I thought we'd blown it. I was about to leave, you know, very disappointed that, you know, I'd cocked it up. Or the groups had cocked it up with the tape recording. And next minute, somebody rushes in and shouts the equivalent, there's a fight. Koshmere goes and pulls out a drawer and gets a big kosh out. He opens the door and there was this poor seaman lying in a pool of blood that the bouncers had worked over him. And next minute, he proceeds to knock shite out of the poor fellow as well. So I thought, maybe it's not a bad thing we don't play here. I come back to Liverpool. The group said, did you get us any work? I said, no. I said, I did a very, very good selling job. And I put the tape on for them. Oh, I said, Alan, it wasn't me. Nobody admitted who'd, you know, because I left the groups to do it on their own. Meantime, I'd uh, got word from uh, Larry Pons that he wanted uh, Howie Casey, Derry and the Seniors, to go to Yarmouth to do a summer season. And then, unfortunately, the lads gave up their work and Pons cancelled it. And I said, well, it's not my fault, but I felt obliged. So I said, well, let's all get in the van, you know, at the minibus in those days, and let's go down to the Two Eyes coffee bar which was the equivalent to the Jacaranda, but was very famous for uh, Cliff uh, Richards, uh, Marty Wilde. All the big names, rock and rollers, were discovered there. So off we went, and I saw the owner, and I said, I brought this group from Liverpool. Can we play in the basement? And he said, yeah, sure. You know, it was free for him. So then uh, the lad says up and we're playing, and then this young lad comes over to me and says, there's this German geezer and he thinks he knows you. So I looked over and I said, yeah, Herr Koschmider. And he said, yeah, Herr Williams. It was like Stanley and Livingstone meeting type thing. So uh, he said, uh, I want this group to come to Hamburg. Instead of coming to Liverpool, he went to London. He had no idea you know, that we were unheard of. And he was directed to the Two Eyes coffee bar. So here Koshmidev, a million to one chance, came to the Two Eyes the exact moment that I was there. So anyway, I got him out of the uh, coffee bar. And so we did the business, and Howie Casey, uh, Derry and the Seniors, were the first group to go over from Liverpool. And they went down so well, the next thing he wanted another group he had another club called the Indra, and he wanted uh, uh, a rock and roll band from Liverpool there. I then thought the Beatles were ready to go and be professional. But, unfortunately, we'd lost Tommy Moore. And then, one night we were all in the Jacaranda with the Beatles, and we could hear this drummer practicing. And uh, around the Jacaranda, there were a lot of warehouses. 
And this young lad, Norman Chapman, uh, he was rehearsing there. And we said, Norman, would you like to be our drummer for the Beatles? And he said, yes, you'd love to. But what he didn't tell us, that he couldn't go to Hamburg because he was uh, being called up for conscription. So Norman Chapman, uh, who was a very, very good drummer, unfortunately for his uh, career, he had to go in the army. So I said to the Beatles, we can't go. We haven't got a drummer. And then they remembered that they used to play in a coffee bar club called the Cash Bar, which was in West Derby Village on the suburbs of Liverpool. And it was owned by uh, a Mrs. Best. And his son was a boy called Pete Best, who was a drummer. And so we phoned him up and he said, yeah, I'd love to go. I've just bought a new kit of drums. So I said, come down to the Jacaranda and do uh, a little audition. So he brought his drums down. I just asked him to do a, a drum roll. He did that. And I didn't know whether it was good or bad, but I liked his personality. And I said, yes, you're in the group if you want to be in the group. And he said he'd love to. And then the next problem was getting the Beatles uh, passports. Pete Best had a problem because uh, his mother was Anglo-Indian and the father had died and he was born in Madras, India. And the biggest problem of all was John Lennon because he was being reared up by his Auntie Mimi. The mother had died tragically in a car accident and the father had disappeared so we had a, a big problem getting him a passport eventually uh, we got a passport for him so then we were all ready to go to Hamburg and they said we've got no money out now the other group uh, Howie Casey they paid their own traveling expenses you know they went by train boat and train and because I liked the Beatles and I also loved Hamburg folks, that I said, well, I'll drive you there, and it'll cost you £10 each. You pay me out of your wages. And they all agreed on that. And then next minute, they said, can you lend us some money to buy some clothes? And I've still got the IOU from Paul McCartney for 15 quid, which he never, ever paid me. And so we all went off uh, to Hamburg, and what a trip that was. I remember loading the van, a little tiny minibus which held, I think, 12 people. And there were 10 of us going down there. And we had to have all the gear, all the clothes, all the suitcases on top of the luggage rack. And then off we went. Then we had to meet uh, another guy, a fellow called Herr Steiner, who did the translations for us. We went over to the Hook of Holland, and then we went through Rotterdam. This is early in the morning. And I was terrified because, you know, we were driving on the other side of the road, and early in the morning, everybody in Holland had bikes, and we were just surrounded by a sea of bikes. And I could still see Lennon telling them all to go to hell, you know, because <laughs> cause they were all leaning on our van. We got out of uh, Rotterdam, and headed towards Arnhem, where there is a famous memorial statue, of which says, their name liveth forevermore. How poetical. I've got a photograph of the Beatles, except John Lennon, who was anti-war and would not uh, go on the photograph. And I don't blame him, really, because as far as the eye could see, was just a sea of white crosses, with all the airborne paratroopers. It was a famous airborne battle of which we got massacred. Anyway, we decided to have a walk round on them. And next minute, we go into a shop, which was something like Hesse's, you know, the famous musical shop in Liverpool, uh, where they sold musical instruments. And uh, we came out, and next minute, they all fell apart, laughing their heads off. And I said, well, what's the joke? Lennon pulls out a mouth organ and begins to play it. And I knew that he hadn't got a mouth organ when we started off. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> are we ever going to get to Hamburg when they're robbing already? And I thought, no, if I go back and take the mouth organ back, that could cause problems. So we just let it go.
For the Beatles, who had become accustomed to lazy days at the Jack, the gruelling apprenticeship they were about to embark upon was to prove to be a real eye-opener in more ways than one. We eventually arrived uh, on the Reaper Barn, which is like the red light district where all the clubs are in Hamburg, and pulled up outside the Kaiser Keller. And it was the first time I've ever known the Beatles to be dumbstruck. Remember, George Harrison was only 17 years of age. And here we were on the Reaper Barn, which is like the red light district. The whole street was like lit up like Blackpool, but we were there. And this is, you know, one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. So we all went down to the Kaiser Keller and there was Howie Casey playing away. And the boy said, oh, wow, this is great. When do we start? And here Koshmi there said, no, you don't play here. You play in the Indra. And they said, well, where's that? And he said, it's a few yards up the road. And so we go to the Indra, which was about three minutes from the Kaiser Keller in the same street. And to my surprise, and to everybody's surprise, it was a strip club, which had uh, plush curtains, uh, fitted carpets, and there was a stripper playing, and about four or five people in the club. And I said, this is not rock and roll. They're not going to back another stripper. Remember that they played for a stripper and they said, oh my God, we've come all the way to Hamburg to back strippers. And Koshmider says, no, tonight is last night for stripper. Tomorrow, rock and roll club. And so the lads were relieved, but really they wanted to go to the Kaiser Keller because that was swinging. Anyway, they played there uh, for a short time a uh, Herr Koshmider was telling the Beatles off because in the Kaiser Keller they had this uh, singer called Derry Wilkie who was like an electric eel and jumped around the stage and on the dance floor and he wanted the Beatles who were playing wooden and said uh, the famous saying, uh, make show. Because I told the lads, look, you've got to make show. You know, because... Look at Howie and them. They've got the place jumpy and you're just standing there, you know, doing nothing. And so the world would go around, make show. And which they did, of course, they were jumping around and like nobody's business. Unfortunately, the Indra, with it being a, a strip club, was not used to rock and roll music. And what we didn't know, that there was no lady who lived above the strip club and because the boys were making Max show and really jumping around, making the place jump, she complained to the police and it was closed, which meant that the Beatles either came home or they alternated with Derry and the seniors in the Kaiser Keller, which they did. They were in competition with one of the best groups in Liverpool. At this point, I'll have to tell you that when I wrote to Howie Casey and said, I'm sending the Beatles over, back came a letter and Howie said to me, Alan, look, you've got a good thing going here. For God's sake, don't send that bum group over the Beatles. Otherwise, you'll louse the whole scene up. And so they had to max show. And then I had to go back to Liverpool. It was uh, interesting the financial uh, side of uh, the Beatles playing over there. The agreement was that they got paid the equivalent of £100 a week. And that's not each, folks. That's for the whole group. But we are talking about the early 60s. It was quite a lot of money. The agreement was that they paid me 10%, which was to be paid into, I can remember the bank's name, Commerce Bank, which was on the Reaper Band. Koshmider promised me that he would take it out of their wages and deposit it in the bank. So they were playing for three months, and the playing times was seven nights a week, between six and eight hours a night. I learned that uh, Koshmider was not paying my commission into the bank. 
and I drove to uh, Hamburg. And meantime, Howie Casey and the group had been uh, terminated because their contract was up. So the Beatles were playing alone, so they weren't even having the breaks. You know, one group on, another group off. Also, the accommodation that the Beatles uh, had to sleep in was absolutely terrifying. He put them in, like, dressing rooms of an old cinema. They didn't even have any water to get washed. They had to wait till the film had finished, and then they would have to go and use the uh, public toilets to get washed and dressed in. That was the accommodation. And I complained. The lad said, no, we're quite happy, Alan. We're, we only crash here. I said, oh, God, are you quite happy with that? He said, yeah. Well, they, they weren't really, but they were so excited at being in Hamburg and enjoying it. And uh, half the time they didn't sleep any anyway there because they had plenty of girlfriends. A fellow called Klaus Vormann, for some reason, found his way into the Kaiser Keller, heard the Beatles, and was absolutely mesmerized and fascinated with them that he went to see his girlfriend, Astrid Kirchner, and said, you must come to the Kaiser Keller. She said, I wouldn't be seen dead in the Kaiser Keller. He said, you must come. There is a group from a place called Liverpool. You must hear them. And so she went with uh, Klaus Vormann and fell in love with Stuart Sutcliffe. And it changed the whole scene. Because she was a trendy and was in the art world, she introduced all the art crowds. So the scene changed from the seamen and all the drunks to the art uh, venue of Hamburg. By that time, Paul was getting fed up with Stuart Sutcliffe's uh, playing ability. Because really, he wasn't a musician. He could only play about three chords. And the only reason why he was in the group was because he was John Lennon's best mate. And Paul uh, wasn't uh, the leader of the band in those days. It was John Lennon's group. But he planned, the same way as, as I think he planned, uh, to get rid of uh, Pete Best. Uh, I would go over there sometimes and see them all mocking show. And poor Stuart, uh, Paul had pulled his leads out. He wasn't even connected up. So much that one night when they were playing there, I wasn't there this night, but uh, Pete Best telling me the story. Uh, Paul used to play piano in Hamburg. Without saying anything to anybody, Stu puts his guitar, guitar down and just punches Paul in the face. Obviously, it had been building up, and I think that was the last time he played with uh, the Beatles. Then Astrid got him a grant to study in the uh, art college in Hamburg, and he decided to pursue his career as an artist. I always remember Stuart coming back uh, to see the band, and he had the strange haircut. And the Beatles fell about laughing. They said, who the hell cut your hair like that? And he said, Astrid. And they said, oh, it looks bloody stupid, Stu, you know. But it grew on them. And in the end, every one of them had the Beatles mop cut by Astrid, except Pete Best. And now Pete says that the style didn't suit him because he hadn't got the shape or hair. He had his hair cut uh, like Tony Curtis. And it was because of this, I think, one of the reasons why he got the sack in the end. And it was coming on to the end of the stay in Hamburg. And they agreed with the owner of the Top Ten Club, a young person called Peter Eckhorn, who unfortunately is dead now, that they would come back to Hamburg but not play for Herr Koschmider, they would play at the top ten, which was their type of club, because he was a young person, and he got on well with them. This upset Herr Koschmider, and he reported them to the police uh, that they were working in Hamburg without work permits. And when they were about to leave, 
uh, Paul McCartney and I think John were messing about with a, a condom uh, of which they lit and scorched the wall. With it being uh, full of dust and, you know, filthy, they just scorched the wall of the dressing room, if you could call it a dressing room. And he accused them of trying to set fire to his cinema. When the police investigated the complaints that Herr Koschmider had made about the Beatles, the police discovered that not only had they not got work permits, but George Harrison was 17. He was underage to play in the red light district. So he and Pete Best were sent home. So the Beatles had come to the end of the engagement, which was seven months in Hamburg. Alan Williams could see the massive potential of the German rock and roll scene and planned to bring the idea lock, stock and barrel to his new club in Liverpool. But sometimes even the best laid plans can come unstuck. I was captivated by what was going on in Hamburg and I decided to open my own top ten club and I was going to alternate the bands from Liverpool to Hamburg and create... Uh, a sort of rock and roll uh, twin cities, as it were. But unfortunately, uh, tragically, it was burnt down. So when the Beatles arrived and they went down to see the top ten club, all they could see was this burnt out smouldering uh, fire. <laughs> so here were the Beatles back in Liverpool with the top ten club destroyed. I'd employed a DJ to work in the top ten, and his name was Bob Wooler. Now, Bob had given up his job as a railway clerk to work full-time at the top ten club, booking the groups and being the comper and DJ. And I said to Bob Wooler, I'm sorry, Bob, uh, it's all over as regards employing you. I said, but I've got this fantastic group coming back from Hamburg. And I said to Bob, will you look after the Beatles while I, you know, get out of the mess I'm in? And he put them on at Little and Town Hall. Now, remember, the Beatles, before they went to Hamburg, were only playing at uh, the Art College once a week and little venues that I got them, like the Grove and the Ballroom. So they were virtually unknown. So much so that the girls used to say to Paul McCartney, you speak very good English for a German band. I mean, the big name groups were Jerry and the Pacemakers, uh, the big three, Cass and the Casanovas, uh, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, whose drummer was uh, Ringo Starr. So Bob Wooler booked him into Little and Town Hall, and that's how Beatlemania started in Liverpool. So here was I, having lost the top ten club, uh, my life was in a bit of a, a muddle because I was opening a new club called the Blue Angel. Uh, Bob Wooler was doing a fantastic job in getting the Beatles work. Now, there was a club downtown called the Cavern Club. Now, the guy uh, who owned it was uh, Ray McFall, and the Cavern was known as a jazz club in Liverpool, but because rock and roll had taken over in a big way, he hadn't adapted or realised the potential of rock and roll in the cavern. He became friends with uh, Bob Wooler and he said, could he help him out? And Bob said, yes, I think I can. Bob Wooler told him that there's this sensational group has just come back from Hamburg and he suggested that he gives them work. One of the big disappointments about the whole uh, rock and roll scene is that I'd planned it. What was to happen? The top 10 club would have been the cavern of Liverpool. But tragic events that I'd lost the club and the cavern took over. And it sometimes it hurts me when I walk down Matthew Street and I see a banner across the road. Matthew Street, the birthplace of the Beatles. So is that this period of transition when they were playing at the cavern and Little and Town Hall, etc., that 
they remembered that they wanted to go back to Hamburg and play in the top 10 club. <laughs> Not my top 10, folks. Yeah, mine was just a smouldering heap. But before they went to Hamburg, the second time, because they'd been deported, basically, they had no chance. One of the main reasons that we were able to go back to uh, play at the top 10 club was that Herr Koschmadir tried to block us because it was in the contract, the original contract, that they weren't allowed to play within six months of leaving Hamburg. But because Herr Koschmadir hadn't paid my commission, he broke the contract. It was harder to get them back as legitimate uh, musicians because the first time we basically smuggled them in as students. But this time they were going as professional musicians. So it was harder to get them back the second time than it was the first time. I had to register myself as a licensed theatrical agency so that I was legitimate. And between Peter Eckhorn, who owned the Top Ten Club, and myself, I had to sign a fidelity bond, guarantee their good behavior. And then, to my amazement, uh, I got this letter from uh, Stuart Sutcliffe saying that John was refusing to pay my commission. And the reason was they claimed that they got the job themselves. But then I'd opened the Blue Angel Club and that was swinging. And I thought, I don't need this. And I wrote them a letter saying, you appear to be getting more than a little swelled headed now. Remember, when nobody else wanted to know you, I was the only one who took an interest. I'm so disappointed in you, but I'll fix it that you'll never ever work in Liverpool again. I remember after I wrote the letter, I went round to uh, Fortland Road, where Paul McCartney lived with his father, Jim, and told Jim the story. And Jim, the father, was on my side. Apparently he wrote a letter to Paul saying that you're not uh, being very fair to Alan Williams. But nothing came of it. I still, I still didn't get my commission, and uh, I lost them. When they came back to Liverpool, they were trying to push the record that they'd made in Hamburg with Tony Sheridan. And there was lunchtime sessions that they would give it all the uh, publicity, saying, go across to your nearest musical uh, record shop and buy the record. And one guy went over in his lunchtime and asked uh, Brian Epstein had he got the record. Brian Epstein owning uh, a shop called NEMS. And because he was intrigued with all the people going over asking for this, my Bonnie, and he was a perfectionist, and if he hadn't got it, he would make sure he'd get it. So he went over to see this uh, group called the Beatles. He was appalled by the state of the cavern, and there were these guys all in their leather gear. By then, they'd all got kitted in complete, you know, black leather. They looked like four Gene Vincents on stage. And then he asked them, could he manage them? At the time, when all the groups finished work, uh, finished all the gigs, they used to come over to the Blue Angel for their social life. And it was like a show business um, club, as it were. So uh, I wasn't really worried about losing the Beatles. I thought uh, they weren't very nice people, what they'd done to me and what I'd done for them. Uh, no one was to know that they were going to be the greatest showbiz band in history. I barred them out from my Blue Angel Club. One night, Brian Epstein came in and he said, uh, Alan, he said, I know that the Beatles, or you consider that the Beatles let you down, but they are sorry for what they did. And... They would like to come into the Blue Angel because all their friends are here. And I thought, oh, you know, let bygones be bygones. Uh, the club's swinging and I don't want to make enemies of them. And so I said, yes, OK, forget it. Uh, they can come in any time. He said, well, they're outside now. <laughs> so back they came into the club. We all threw our arms around each other, like sort of as if even the bad days were good. 
and then we became friends that I've never fallen out with them since, except for trying to sell Paul McCartney's leather trousers, folks. But that's another little story. I remember one night in the Blue Angel, and George Harrison uh, called me over. He was going out with a lovely girl called uh, Bernadette. And he said, hey, Al, you tell Bernadette, when we were all composing music, wasn't I composing music with them? It was, we, we did it all together. It wasn't just Paul, you know, and John. But Brian Epstein wanted it to be known that the songwriters was Paul and John. And he said they cut me out. He said, I think it's very, he was very, very upset about it. Nobody knows the story, but, you know, they were all writing together. Stuart Sutcliffe, who was my friend, uh, tragically died of a brain hemorrhage in Hamburg. And I was the one who got the phone call from Astrid telling me that he died in her arms on the way to the hospital. I had to go around to Mrs. Sutcliffe. I think she lived in Ullet Road at the time. Uh, and I broke the news to her. Oh, God, it was awful, because she loved Stuart. She loved the bones, um, and she was heartbroken. Brian Epstein was the manager then, and uh, I arranged that she goes on the same flight to Hamburg with uh, Brian Epstein. I always uh, remember Brian telling me that when they, the aircraft landed in uh, Hamburg, uh, that all the Beatles were there crying their hearts out over the tragic death of uh, Stuart. There were a few sad moments in my life when the Beatles were famous. Uh, my son's godfather was uh, a person called Alan Owen who'd written A Hard Day's Night. And he invited me to go to the premiere at the Odeon Cinema in Liverpool. And as we walked past the VIP room, there they were, all the social climbers, all quaffing the champagne, and I couldn't, I couldn't even go into the room. I just sat in my seat uh, with uh, Alan Owen's father. And at the end of it, there was a, a bit of a reception. But as soon as the subtitles came up, I left the cinema. Unknowing to me, the Beatles also left because they didn't want to, uh, you know, have the problem with the crowds. And I remember walking into London Road and it was pouring down with rain and I only had, uh, you know, a, a, a suit on that. So I was drowned and next minute this limo passed and the Beatles saw me through, even though the windows were, you know, <laughs> rain washed or a wash with rain. And I could see them out saying, there's Alan. And they all waved to me. And then on they went to their reception. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm making this CD is that I would like the world to know my involvement, which I consider was very, very important. And certainly Brian Epstein, uh, he wanted the world to think that he discovered the Beatles, that they didn't exist until he came on the scene. A lot of documentaries have been written about the Beatles where I don't even get a mention. It's as if um, Hamburg never happened. It's as if all those days when they used to borrow money and when they were, uh, you know, bumming free coffees in the jacaranda and bacon butties, it's as if they didn't want the world to know that part of their history, which I think I'd be proud if I was the Beatles to start from such humble beginnings. And here is Paul McCartney, a billionaire, when I can still see him in the jacaranda arguing with John Lennon because John wanted jam on the toast. And Paul said, you must be mad, it's a penny extra. But now I look upon it as just to be a cog in the history of the Beatles. How many people would like to say that they managed the Beatles? That's the reward that I'll take to the grave with me. We are now coming to the end of my story 
of the formative years of the Beatles. I do hope you've enjoyed listening to me. I've had lots of good memories about the Beatles. What I would like to say, if any Beatles are listening, thanks for the memory and the happiness that you've created throughout the world. God bless you.